Amen and amen. Amen. Well, did you bring a Bible today? One that's not glowing, one that doesn't require a charger. Did you bring a Bible today? Everyone's like, no, man, it's, I brought my, my phone. Uh, if you got a Bible today, go with me to the book of John, John chapter 14. And man, am I excited to preach this sermon today uh, because I think it is such a relevant uh, topic and such a relevant uh, word that we need in our culture today. Uh, we're on this series that we've been in for the last number of weeks called On Mission on mission. And we have been talking about the reality that all of us have been called by God to the exact same thing. I've said it every time I've preached, but I'm going to say it again. While yes, you are precious and beautiful and wonderful in God's eyes, and you're so unique and so special and have all these gifts and abilities, and that at the end of the day, you ain't that special. <laughs> you ain't that unique because all of us, we've been called by God to the same thing. And the thing that we have been called by God to is to be on mission, co-laboring with Jesus himself and with one another for the purpose of seeing souls saved and disciples made. And we, we've said this almost every week, but wherever it is you find yourself, whatever your vocation is, Maybe God did call you and God did lead you to the profession you're in, to the school that you're going to or the team that you're on. We've been saying this, that your location, it's, it's simply the place that God has brought you or placed you to live out the purpose and plan that he has for you. So the call of God on my life is not to be a firefighter or a lawyer or a dog walker. The call of God on my life, Matthew 28, is to go into all the world and make disciples, to go into all the world and to leverage what God has given me within the sphere of influence God has placed me in and, and, and say, God, would you use me to see people get saved? People come to the saving knowledge of the truth and people have a growing relationship with you. God, my, my career, my business, my team, my school. It's just the location that you called and you placed me in so I can live out this great calling that you have on my life. And we said this the very first week that in Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, because all authority has been given to him, he is well within his rights to tell us what to do. That the great commission actually is an essential part of our faith. It's actually a command of Christ that all of us one day will stand before the living God and we will give a post-conversion account of how we stewarded our life. We're, we're, we're all called to this. And we talked about in the second and third week how because we're called to this, we have to be mission-minded. We have to be intentionally thinking about, focused on, allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us and lead us every day, saying, God, today I'm going to, to my classroom. I'm going to my business. I'm staying home today with these children, God. And today I want to be mindful of how you're asking me to be on mission today. And we talked about last week uh, simply our motivation, that the motivation that should be fueling us and driving us is not obligation, but it is a deep love for people. Uh, we'll read this here in, in a moment, but John 3.16 says that God so loved the world. It doesn't say God was so angry with the world. God was so sick of the world. God was so fed up with all, no, God. So he so loved the world. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. Why? Because there's this great love and compassion that fills God's heart. And today, as we continue in the series, I want to talk about today the mission message. In other words, I want to talk about today what is the gospel. Now, Mark 16, it's not where I asked you to turn, but Mark chapter 16, uh, I want to read to you verses 15 and 16. We use this the very first week, but I want you to see something that will connect the dots as to why we are talking about what the gospel is. Mark chapter 16, uh, reading from the New King James Version, verse 15, it says this, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And verse 16, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Circle back to verse 15. Let's read this again. Jesus, here's his command. It goes hand in hand with Matthew 28, the great commission. And he said to them, go into, we'll, we'll contextualize it for us. Go into your world. Can I ask you this morning to consider for a moment, what is your world? 
What, what is your lane? What's your space? Where's the place that God has led you, called you, directed you, no matter your age and stage? Again, could be your career, could be your business, could be the team you play on, could be the circle of friends that you have. It could be the people that you play golf with every week. Who, who is your world? He says, go into your world and preach the gospel to every creature. Did you know this morning that even though you might not be standing up here with a microphone, that we're all preachers. Oh no, Brandon, not me. I'm not, I'm not really a preacher. I'd actually probably assume you're a great preacher because preaching is just to proclaim something. Preaching is just to declare something as truth. And here's what I know that all of us, we get excited and we get passionate and we get full, uh, full of conviction about stuff. And we're preaching stuff every day. Some of you, you are preaching the diet that you're on. Some of you, you are preaching your favorite hobby. I, I, I know a guy that he's like preaching cold plunge all the time because it changed his life. Preaching is just declaring something. And all, are we actually really good at preaching? Some of us, we, we let all of our fingers do the talking on, on, on social media. You get us in the right setting with the right people and all, are we a preacher? So preaching is just to declare. It's to proclaim something as truth. And Jesus said, I'm calling you to go into the world and to declare, to proclaim the truth of the gospel to every creature. We are called to everywhere we go, whether we got a microphone in our hand or not, to be those who proclaim and declare the gospel. Which would lead to this question, do, do we really know what the gospel is. Do, do, do we really have it in our hearts? Because here's the reality, what you do not know and what you do not have in your heart is not going to come out of your mouth. If you said, Brandon, I, I need you to just preach for a minute on physics. I could spell it and I could try to define it, but there's, not, there's nothing in here and there's nothing in here that would, with conviction and, and, and education, be able to if we're called by God to preach the gospel, we better have it right here. And we better have it right here. We better have it in our mind that we go, I actually know what the gospel is. I actually know what the good news of Jesus is, what it's all about. And it's so deep in my heart. It's so transforming and changing my own life that you, you don't have to ask me twice out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth. It, there's a passage in Jeremiah, I forget the exact location, but Jeremiah goes, oh, God, when I found your word, I consumed it. And he goes, and I was weary of holding it back. In other words, this word got so deep in me, it was painful, it was difficult to even hold it back. What if you not only got the gospel right here, but what if you so let the good news of Jesus change you in here? You went from being someone who goes, oh, I'm not really a preacher to someone who goes, man, I'm weary of holding. I, I can't keep my mouth closed everywhere I go. I can't help but proclaim and declare and tell people and talk to people about the good news of what Jesus has come to do for all of humanity. I ask you to turn with me today to the book of John. Uh, the, mess, the title of the message, if you're interested in the title today, simply is Mission, mission Message. And we are talking today about what the gospel is and what that message is. And I ask you to turn with me today to John chapter 14. I want to read the first six verses. And I want to let this for us today uh, paint a picture for us of what the gospel is. And then just kind of letting you know where I'm going from there. And then we will go and uh, we're, we're actually going to look at kind of three essential truths that, that, that should be in our response to the gospel. But reading out of the New King James Version, here's what Jesus said. Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, don't, don't you love Thomas's honesty? Uh, Lord, we actually don't know where you're going or what you're talking about. 
How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, uh, key, key verse for us this morning, he said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And listen to this. We, 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 we like to quote the first part. Ah, oh, Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and the life. But we're not so readily willing to quote this last part. And no one, and this we're like youth group, I'd have everyone say no one, but it's not, so I won't have you do that. Because I can always tell that, you, that predominantly people hate that. Um, but no one comes to the Father except through me. I don't know if, if you, you know this or you've uh, been able to put uh, definitions to it. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in the field, and so I come to you humbly with what I do know and not trying to suppose what I don't know. But we're living today in, uh, we've talked about this in series past, but in a postmodern slash applied postmodern culture. Uh, very, very simply put, if you don't know what that is, again, I'm not an expert in the field, but to the best of my understanding, uh, the postmodern thought would say this, that everything we know as truth is simply a social construct. Uh, po Postmodern thinkers and philosophers, they would say the entire framework of what you know to be true, what our nation has been founded on, the bedrock of our society, all that we know to be absolute truth, it's all simply made up. It's a made-up social construct that was put in place by men and people who were just trying to maintain the power they had and get more power over people. This would be the postmodern thought. The postmodern thought says this, that there is no such thing as absolute truth. There is no such thing as absolute truth. All truth is uh, it's based on what you've self-concluded. Well, you know, my truth is, I, I understand that, man, but, you know, my belief is that all truth that is self-concluded and experiential. So, so no longer do we get to tell anybody what truth is. No longer do we even get to have a conversation about, well, you know, but the truth, no, there, there is no such thing as truth. All, all that we know to be true is simply the social construct. And postmodern thinkers would say, just be aware of that. Hey, next time you're at coffee with someone and they're trying to share their opinion with you about something, just be aware. It's probably not truth, unless it's truth for you, because there is no such thing as truth. Um, I have so many examples just from the limited research I've done about how absolutely bonkers and ridiculous uh, this, this is and where this has gone. But, but this postmodern thinking, applied postmodern thinking comes along and simply says this, we shouldn't just be aware of it. We should do everything we can to destroy it. Postmodern thinking goes, just be aware of it. Applied postmodern thinking, this is the culture, the fabric of our society today, whether you recognize it or not, says we need to burn to the ground all that has been established. We need to dismantle and dismember all that has been established as truth. And the highest value in our culture today, it's love. But here's how culture would define love. Love is defined as celebrating and exalting any individual's experiential and self-realized truth. Here's the highest value. It's just love. Hey, man, our, our goal today, all we're trying to do is just love people. And while it sounds really good, when you really dig down into it, the definition of love is not love as we would define it biblically. The definition of love is to celebrate and to exalt anyone's self-realized experiential truth. It is a pluralistic culture that we're living in that says we're all just trying to, you know, get along despite our individual beliefs, make room for everyone's individual beliefs. And while it really does sound good, like there are parts to it that, that, that they kind of feed the appetite of just uh, your, 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 your logic, the appetite of you wanting to kind of be a good person and love people. And I'm trying to be like, I mean, Jesus loved everybody, right? And while there's parts of it that sound good, let me just be very clear this morning. Um, it is anti-gospel. It's anti-gospel. There, there, there are uh, believers and sections of Christianity today who have adopted this line of thinking. Well, this is the gospel. Listen, man, God is love, bro. Bro, it's in there, man. Like, like literally the Bible defines God. God is love. Like, he just loves everybody. And, and they, they would define the gospel, the good news, as because God just loves everybody. That Jesus, Jesus is just, just such a cool guy, man. 
Like, oh man, I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed sometimes. Like, Bob, are you kidding me? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at what Jesus has done. He just, he's so good. He loves everybody. And so he came and died on the cross. So we can all just be who we want to be and be what we feel. And all of it's covered by his great love. So all roads lead to, to heaven. And it is a anti-biblical, anti-gospel thought that is not the gospel. John chapter 14, we, we, we read this. And in John chapter 14, it's not the primary focus of our study today, but there's three truths in this passage that I want you to see. Uh, the three truths simply are this. You can write them down. Uh, that life is short and eternity is real. So, so today, broad brush, we're just saying, what, what is the gospel? What is it that we say we actually believe? Um, Jesus in John 14, he helps us to see that life is short and eternity is real. That relationship with God, it is the goal and, and that Jesus is the only way. Going back to John chapter 14, let's read this one more time. Uh, starting in verse one, Jesus talking to his disciples who are fearful because he's about to leave. And he goes, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And listen to what he says. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Pause for a minute. The first thing I see in this passage is Jesus telling them, reminding us today that this life is not our home. Remember there's a scripture, you could write it down if you want, but Matthew 6, verse 19 through, uh, 18 through 19, I believe, maybe 19 through 20, it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust are store. Do not make your life about this life. Do not get consumed and deceived by, by your eyes and the lust of your flesh and the culture you live in to make all of your aims and efforts about this place. He says, because moth and rust will destroy, this is temporary, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Have you ever just gotten captivated by the moment before? There's someone who I know who I will not use their name, uh, but they have a mild dairy allergy. And um, they're really good about like not doing dairy. By the way, if you have a dairy allergy, um, I, I pray for you. And I, my heart goes out to you um, because all of my favorite foods, I realize they involve dairy, like ice cream and cheese and, and whatnot. Um, like I can't imagine a world without dairy. And so I'm praying for you. But, but they have this mild dairy allergy. They, they, they do pretty good. But oh, you get them at a Mexican restaurant. They're like, bring the chips and queso. Yay. But you, you got to, it's worth it. And, and, and they're, they're captivated by the moment. And while it's silly, we kind of live this way. We live captivated by right here, right now, this life, this earth. And Jesus says to his disciples, he, he goes, guys, um, I want your heart to not be troubled because he, here's the reality. I am going, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. There, there, there are large spaces and places. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come back, I am coming back. When I come back, I'm coming back to bring you to, to me. But what's he helping them to see in that moment? Guys, this is not your home. This, this life, it is temporary, it is short, life is short, and eternity is real. And the goal, the big idea, as simplistic as it sounds, it's relationship with God. It's what, it's what he says in, in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you, listen to this, to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. If you track all the way back to the book of Genesis, remember what God's original intent was? It was walking in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. It was intimate, undefiled relationship with you and I. I know that it's cheesy, but, but it's the truth. I heard a pre one preacher say that there's a God-sized hole in every human's heart that only he can fill. And, and the reality is that there's, there's truth to that, that we were actually in part created for intimate, unbroken relationship with God. 
Do, 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 do you know why so much of our life and so much of, of humanity is groping and searching and going from thing to thing to thing to thing, looking for and hoping for satisfaction to no end because we were created for something that only God can give. There's something in us, there's something in our soul that it craves, it needs the thing we were created for and that is intimate relationship with God, with our creator, with, with the home, if you will, of our soul. And Jesus goes, I'm, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But make no mistake about it, the reason I'm going to prepare a place for you is so that I can come back and I can bring you to myself. The, 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 the problem and where all of this got messed up is this word sin. I, I know that we're all educated people, and so I, I want to uh, assume that you don't know what sin is, but just in case there is someone who maybe doesn't know, the simplest way that I, I've heard it defined is sin is like when you're playing basketball and you shoot the ball nine feet and six inches, but the rim is 10 feet. Sin is simply missing the mark. Did you know that God has a standard? Did you know that God actually, because there is such thing as truth, that God has a standard and God gets to, because he is God, define what truth is? And sin, whether it's big or small in your eyes, is simply when we miss the mark. God goes, here is what my standard is. Here is what my commandment is. Here's what I'm asking you to do. And you simply, you've missed the mark. And the Bible says in 1 John that God, he is a holy God. First John uh, chapter one says that in God, there is no darkness at all. That in God, God is light and in him is not even a shred of darkness. He is a holy God. And therefore, when sin entered the equation, because God is a righteous and a holy God, it would be a compromise to who he is, to the very nature of God, to be in intimate, close proximity with you and I in our sin and in our brokenness. So sin enters the world because Adam and Eve ate the apple. They, 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 they fell for the deception of the evil one, which all of us should be putting both our hands up saying like, yeah, me too. Because we, the Bible goes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And sin caused there to be this separation this, this gap that we could not cross. But Jesus. What, what, why is it John 14, 6? We'll, we'll read that again. Jesus says to Thomas, he goes, Thomas, you know the way to where I'm going. I literally don't, Jesus. What are you talking about? You're going to some place. Like, what, what are we saying? And he goes, no, Thomas, you know. He said, I am, look at the language, the way. I am the truth and the life. Don't you allow the pluralistic culture we live in to, to deceive you. All roads do not lead to good. All roads do not lead to, to God. He's, Jesus, no, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. Why is Jesus the only way? In short, because Jesus, he's the only one who is fully God, fully man, who came from heaven to earth. Jesus is the only one who lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life. He's the only one who was qualified to be the sacrifice for all of sin, for all of humanity. He's the only one as the perfect, spotless, sinless, sinless man. He's the only one who died on the cross as payment for all of our sin, for all Time. He is the only one who for three days defeated death, hell, and the grave and was resurrected on the third day victoriously. He is the only one who has, who has closed the gap between us and God. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that, that we're ambassadors of this message of reconciliation. There's this gap between you and God and you on your best day, you and your best efforts, you and all your self-discipline and achievement, you can't even get close to closing the gap. The only one, the only way, truth, and life that can close the gap and reconcile relationship, it is Jesus and faith in his finished work. What is the gospel? You can put that slide up there again. The gospel in short, it is that life is short and eternity is real. Hey, hey, actually, th this is not our home. This is not our end. 
this, this will, will in the blink of an eye be over and when it is over, eternity it is real. And eternally we will either be in a place called heaven with him forever or we will suffer the weight and the consequences of our sin in eternal damnation. Life is short. Eternity is, is real. In relationship with God, it is the goal. God is, he, he so loved the world that he is saving us through his son that we might have reconciled relationship. And Jesus is the only way. See, the, the reason the culture that we live in and this, this, this applied postmodern pluralistic thought, the reason it's anti-gospel is because it's anti-singular truth. And there is a singular truth the Bible tells us. It is the foundation of our very faith and it is that life is short. Eternity is real. God desires intimate, reconciled relationship. He's the only way to true life and joy and fulfillment. And there is only one way to, to the Father, Jesus said. And that is through, through him. I want to give you three, from that standpoint, three responses or three key factors in our gospel message. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. It is simply this word, repentance. Repentance. Uh, repentance is not an emotion. Repentance is not a feeling. Uh, repentance, by, by definition, it is a change of direction. Repentance is not, oh man, I just feel so bad that I ate the entire Ben and Jerry's ice cream last night. I just, I shouldn't have done that. But I'm going to do it again tonight. It's not repentance. Repentance is not feeling bad. Repentance is a change of direction. It is a, I was going this way, I was thinking this way, and I am 180 degrees, I'm, I'm turning. And the Bible says in the book of uh, in, in the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus came, and this is the message that he came to preach. Matthew 4, 17, it says momentarily, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus came and the, the, the gospel he was preaching was he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came and from the time that he was baptized, he was preaching and proclaiming this message, repent Turn, turn from your thinking, turn from your living, turn from the ways that are moving this direction. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the Bible is clear. You, we won't read all of these, but you can write them down for reference. Romans 3.23, Romans 5.12, and Romans 6.23, they all tell us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us Every single person on the planet, on their best day, falls short of the glory of God, falls short of perfection. We have all sinned, the Bible says, and the wages of sin is, is death, it's destruction. So an essential ingredient or, or component of this gospel message, it is that we, we have to repent and turn from our sin. The, the, the good news is not that God just loves you so much that you can just keep doing and living and being however you want because God is love. No, the, the, the gospel is life is short, eternity is real. God wants relationship with you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God has some things in store for you. He, he is the only way and, and you must repent of your sin and turn to him. This is the second component that we see is faith, faith that we, we, we have to put faith and trust in Jesus. A couple of scriptures to consider, John three sixteen. here's what the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone on the planet will have everlasting life. Know that whoever believes, that, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but of everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8 says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. What is the grace of God? The undeserved, unearned, unmerited love, blessing, favor of God that has freely and generously been poured out. Oh, thank you for your grace, God. You know, we've been saved by grace, but it is through faith, not of ourselves. I love this. It's the gift of God, not of ourselves. In other words, you can't earn or deserve it. 
So before a minute your mind goes legalist, no, it's not about achieving. It's not about doing. It's not about perfection. It's not something you can give to yourself. It is the gift of God that's been given to us because of our faith in him. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you would confess with your mouth and notice, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with, uh, look at this, verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. An essential component of this gospel message, it is faith in Christ. It is belief that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what he said he did and he will do what he said he will do. It is faith and confidence and trust, not in my own efforts, not in my own abilities, but in the finished work of what Jesus has done. But how does that co coincide with, with, with repentance though? James 2.17 uh, says this, thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. I love, I love verse 18. But if someone will say, well, you know, you have faith and I have works, I would say, show, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So how, how does faith and repentance, how, how do they, they, they coexist? Well, the Bible goes, salvation is through faith in Christ, but faith without action is dead. Does that point to something that's legalistic? It's not legalistic. It's simply saying if you really believe something, it should change the way you act. It should change your life. If I handed you a water bottle on a hot day, like yesterday, I helped someone move yesterday, and, and by the grace of God, I'm here today. And, and, and on a hot day, you're hot. Man, I, I need water right now. Hand you water. Hey, man, here's some fresh water. But just so you know, I put poison in it. If you believed me, you, you would reject the water. But if you didn't believe me, you'd go, ah, okay. And, and it's a simple way of illustrating that what you really believe is how you live. James simply goes, now don't tell me you have faith in Christ. Show me you have faith in Christ. Because you can't say you believe that Jesus is the Lord. You can't say, no, I believe that Jesus came to rescue and to redeem us from our sin. I, I, you can't say, I believe that Jesus, he's the only way to real life and simultaneously reject all of his ways, reject all of his commandments and, and, and say, but, but, but I, I still wanna like run the show, that, that doesn't work. Then, then, then your faith is in, is in maybe thinking, it's ethereal, but it's not. James goes, faith without works is dead. So. Essential components of, of, of the gospel mess is repentance from sin. Jesus, I am, I am a sinful man in need of a savior. I repent of my sin. And I put my faith and my trust in you as the Lord of my life. And number three, we close with this. And, and lastly, this, this third essential component, it is this word confession. Confession. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10, we'll, we'll read that passage again. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. That if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes under righteousness and with the mouth Again, if we're in youth group, I might have you say the mouth. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I love Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is talking to all of his disciples. He goes, guys, um, who, who do you say that I am? Who, who do you say that I am? Their response is, well, you know, some people say you're a great prophet. Some people say you're a great teacher. Some people say you're crazy. I'm just letting you know what's out there, Jesus. It's, it's, but a lot, lot, lot of mi mixed opinions. And he goes, no, who do you say that I am? Can I ask you that question this morning in a, in a personal way? Who do you say that Jesus is? Does, it doesn't matter what, what, what your parents say. Doesn't matter what your spouse says. Doesn't matter what 
The pr- who do you? Because did you know that we, it's not like a group project when we stand before Jesus? Like, like you remember that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Like, there, there is no phoning a friend. There, it's, who, no, you. Who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter responds, he, he responds and answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Bible says salvation comes when we repent of our sin. When we believe in our heart that Jesus is the Lord. And with our mouth, we profess, we confess, Jesus, you are the Lord. And I give you my life. Mark 16, we read it at the very beginning. Jesus says, go into all the world and just try really hard to not be offensive. I mean, I am love after all. Wouldn't want you giving me a bad reputation. What's funny is in our culture today, we, we, we're really good at taking scriptures out of context and using them to our advantage. Like the, 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 the one that I love, and, and by the way, there's, it's truth, but, but I love how we take it out of context. Well, you know, the Bible says speak the truth in love. And, and we've interpreted, interpreted that as just don't be offensive. Just say, just, just don't rock the boat, anybody. Yeah, but, but it's the truth though. I, I, I know it's the truth, but Jesus said, say it in love. But, but Jesus didn't say, don't be offensive. In fact, can I just say, not that I'm advocating for you to go be offensive. It's like, man, best church service ever. I've been given a lot of liberty to just do the thing I like most, offend people. No, don't, don't do that. But, but do you know that Jesus himself was offensive? That Jesus actually said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I, I didn't come to just not rock the boat. I came with a truth and a reality that it will cut right down the middle and cause a dividing line. I, I came to bring a truth and a reality that it will not be received, it will not be accepted by all, but for anyone who would receive it and believe, they would be saved. It is not our goal to just not be offensive. But Jesus said, okay, guys, go and proclaim the gospel. I want you to go into your world and preach the truth. I want you to go into your, your, your space and your place and the places that I've called you and I sent you. I want you to go into that office building. I want you to go into your classroom. I want you to go into, into that basketball court and on that. I want you to go and proclaim the truth. What's the truth, Jesus? That this life, it is but a vapor. It's all fun and games right now, but when it ends eternity, we'll meet all of us face to face. That this life has eternal consequences. And I so love all of my children that have been separated by sin, that I sent my son Jesus to live and to die and to be resurrected again, paying the price for all of sin of all all time. I came to rescue and redeem, but there is only one way to salvation. And it's me, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so in the most loving, gentle, humble, kind way I possibly can, my mandate is to with every opportunity I have to tell people the truth. Listen, man, I, I get it. But the truth is, the truth is, this life is not forever. God loves you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God wants to help you. God wants to help your family. But bro, you got to repent. You got to turn from your sin. God will not bless you in your sin. God will not bless you in rebellion. You got to turn and repent from your sin, man. You got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and give your life to him for he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. Can I I just say, and then I I promise we're done. I think that God is so good that when we get good at just telling the truth, when we get good at being people who preach the gospel, 
that God will actually show up in those spaces and places. And while you're preaching, while you're proclaiming, God will be doing something in someone's heart you can't see. Do you know why, why I believe this? Because Acts chapter two, the Bible goes, the Holy Spirit came and he filled all of them and all these people showed up to make fun of them. What are you guys, drunk? What are you doing right now? What, what is going, this is ridiculous. And, and mocking them, making fun of them. What's, what's happening? The Bible goes, Peter stands up full of the Holy Spirit and he starts preaching the gospel. And in the middle of his gospel presentation, the Bible goes, something happened. He didn't give an altar call. Something happened and they went, hold on for a second, man. Just tell us what do we have to do to be saved? You know, you know why? Because it's not your job to convict people's hearts, it's his job. You can't convince anybody of anything. Let's just call that what it is. Jesus even said to Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. In other words, you didn't get that from my sermon. You didn't get that from watching the miracles. You didn't get that because of me. You got that because God did something deep. He gave you revelation. That didn't come by flesh and blood. That came by the spirit of God. It is only the spirit of God that can convict hearts of sin, open blinded eyes to the truth. But it's our job. It's our job to be preachers of the good news, trusting that as I take every opportunity I can to in love, gentle, but not being afraid of being offensive at times, give people the good news of Jesus, that God will work on my behalf. God will do something I cannot do. Paul, Paul says, listen, man, we're just plant seed and we're just watering out here, but God's the one giving the increase. And that there's nothing special about, about, about me, Paul said. I'm just planting seed, speaking truth, preaching the gospel, being unashamed, being unafraid. I'm watering that, just, just, just doubling down. No, this is the truth. This is the gospel. And God's the one bringing the increase. We are called to not just tell people that God loves them. God loves you. God bless you. Have a good day. I'll pray for you. It's not the mandate. We are called to preach the gospel. Life is short. Eternity is real. God's got good things in store, but we have to believe in Jesus. You gotta repent of your sin. You have to believe in your heart and put faith in him. And you gotta confess with your mouth that he is the Lord. Would you stand on your feet? Would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, today, in light of everything happening in our, in our country today, in light of everything happening in the culture that we live in today, oh Lord Jesus, I'm reminded, maybe, maybe in these moments more than ever before, uh, of how desperate our world is for people who are just committed to preaching the gospel. Pe people who are willing to, without compromise, proclaim the truth of what Jesus has said, that he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And so I pray today, God, for every single person under the sound of my voice, even those who are and will be watching online, that in Jesus' name, first and foremost, it would start with us. Would you convict our hearts of truth? Convict our hearts that Jesus is the only way. Convict our hearts to a point that we repent of sin, that we put faith in Christ, that we confess with our mouth that you are the Lord. But I pray that, that would so get in us and change us that God, you would empower us by your spirit to go out and to in every space and place that you've called us to, to preach the gospel. Would you empower us, God, to be gospel preachers, gospel presenters, good news tellers. And I pray that as we do, you would work on our behalf and you would use us in a mighty way to see people saved and come to know you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This moment before we dismiss, um, I want to encourage you. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that, that today is the day. Today's the day. It, 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 the Bible goes, if you hear the voice of God, don't be like the children of Israel who harden their hearts. No, respond today. And I want to give you an invitation. If you're here today 
and you never have, or you don't know for sure that you've really put your faith in Christ in a way that leads to salvation, today's the day. I, I wanna invite you to not just r- rush out the doors, but that you would stop and you would come as we close today and we close in a song of worship, that, that you would come and you'd find someone, one of our prayer and altar team members, and, and you'd ask them to pray with you. You, you. you would ask them to help you to make that decision. And today you would make the decision to give Jesus your life in, in total surrender. As we close today and as our altar team is available, let's sing one last chorus together and the pastor Spencer will dismiss us here in a moment.